Okay, um, let's get started. Um, we've got plenty of cake left over from the, uh, the surprise and steel design, so if anybody wants any more cake, uh, you're more than welcome to. Uh, real quick, um, you do have a homework in here due on Monday. Um, other than uh, probably some components of the last problem, you should be good, which by the way, I do have those handouts that I forgot to have printed off. I do have those. In addition, I guess another worthy announcement would be I have a lot of handouts left over from last time. I, if you recall, I had like five or six handouts that I handed out last time. I've got some on serviceability, on development length, on compression members, on beam columns, and then I have a, a design chart. Um, I have a lot, hold on, hold on guys, real quick. I have a lot left over, which means a lot of you didn't get, get them last time. So if you didn't get handouts last time, I mean, please feel free to go over and grab them. But I mean, I've got like, I mean, I print off one per student. So when I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them, that means eight of you didn't get them. So if you didn't grab handouts in concrete last time, I mean, get them. Because that's literally everything between now and the rest of the semester. Uh, by the way, I do have the handouts, uh, the doubly reinforced ones, and I'm passing those out. So one, two, three, four, and uh, he'll be here. One, two, three, four. Bless you. Okay. Um, Okay, so again, all right. Did you get those last time? Yeah. That's what it was. All right. So, did everybody over here, did everybody get the handouts from last time? Did you get the handouts? Everybody get the handouts from last time? Yeah. On what? Homework for solution. I, ha I haven't gotten it graded yet, so. But I, hopefully that you'll get that back on Monday. That's the plan. So. Not homework five. Not, not the solution. Wait, wait, wait. Oh yeah, I do have. It. Yeah. It's, did you not get one? I tell you what. I tell you what. I sent the notebook around in steel design on Friday, and the concrete one around on Monday. I don't have it with me, but I'll send that around on Monday. So if there's that and there's anything else you're, you're, you're missing, I'll, I'll make sure and have that. I will try and remember to print off an extra Homework 4 solution for you on Monday. Sound good? If you email me, then I'll, then I'll, I'll be sure to remember. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Um, before I go on to doubly reinforced beams, you do have a homework assignment due on Monday. So. I thought I would entertain any questions. Do, does anybody have any questions on the homework five? Is it hard? <laughs> Hydraulics. Right? A anything at all? What? Oh. I do need to cover the doubly reinforced uh, uh, compression steel not yielding problem, so everybody can potentially do that on the uh, on the homework if you need to. I'm not sh sure if that one yields or not. They will not, because it's just more bending stuff. And you had, honestly, in my opinion, you had one hell of a bending test. We don't need to do it another one. So because those topics really don't marry well with shear and deflections, which come next. Shear and deflections are their own unique snowflakes. So they're not they're not it's just not the same. So all right. Everybody good? Okay. Um, if so then let's uh, let me pull the notes back up and now you have them for a uh, doubly reinforced shape. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through them in a little bit more or I'm not going to go through them in as much detail, but I have a couple things I do want to harp on. So um, I mentioned the, the uh, 
advantages of, I guess, counting on uh, doubly reinforced sections? I mean, I don't really think that we need to worry about designing a beam so that it is doubly reinforced. I just need you to be aware that more often than not, the compression steel is there um, just for tying together the rebar cage. You do get some perks. I mean, you do get some increase in capacity if you count on it. Later on, when we look at deflections, there's actually two different types of uh, deflections that we will uh, compute. There's immediate deflections or instantaneous deflections, and then there's long-term deflections because over time, concrete properties change. So if I put some load on a beam, you know, it'll have some deflection. But if I keep that load on there for 30 years and come back 30 years later, the deflection will change uh, because concrete properties change. So you have to uh, address that. And if you count on compression steel, you get a, bit, a little bit of a benefit on those long-term deflections. But we'll, we'll get into that um, uh, later. Uh, <laughs> but that, um, also, more often than not, the compression seal is there. It's there to hold up the rebar cage. So if you can, uh, uh, if you can count on it, you can get a little bit of a, uh, a benefit. Um, like T-beams, we split them up into two uh, couples, the couple between the tensile steel and the concrete, and the couple between the tensile steel and the compression steel. And we did a moment uh, capacity problem last time where we learned how to compute MN. And it's the same MN formula. It's the compressive force in the concrete times D minus A over 2 uh, times the compressive, or plus the compressive force in that steel up top times D minus D prime, which, by the way, any term related to a compressive steel element has a prime associated with it, like AS prime, D prime, uh, et cetera, epsilon sub S prime. <laughs> um, the most challenging component, like I said, is whether or not the compression steel yields. Now, our first example, we found that it, it did. Um, now, how did we find that out? Well, we found that out by checking the strain. So, epsilon sub S prime is just 0 0.003. C minus D prime over C, it's just similar triangles, um, just like it was before. And um, we compare that against the yielding strain. If this is larger, then it is in fact yielded and our compressive force is simple. If not, it's a little more challenging because we have to use that linear relationship between uh, the stress and the strain, and that's where Young's modulus comes into play. So um, the equation can get a little more uh, challenging, but Ultimately, it's, it's the same thing. You, uh, you, you use the same equilibrium principles, set C equal to T. When you set those terms equal to one another, if you have a situation where the compression steel hasn't yielded and you isolate all those terms based on that neutral axis depth, you get a quadratic equation. So what I've done is I've tried to break everything up into nice brackets. So this is the quadratic term. This is the linear term. This is the constant term. Notice there's a negative right there. It's the only thing I would, I would point out. So when you plug it into the Casio or whatever calculator that you use, make sure you're, uh, you're aware of that. All right. Sound good? Whatever calculator you use. The Casio FX115 ES Plus or the HP50G will, will, will handle this computation. All right. <laughs> what? All right. This is the wrong notebook. Um, no. I will. I will. I promise I will. It's Dr. Birthday Boy. So. <laughs> Sign in sheet. There we go. <laughs> He's like, that just made my semester. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. So let me find the example. Come on. Okay, all right. So this was the example that we were working on last time. We already did uh, 11A. <laughs> um, we've got four KSI concrete. So let's make sure <laughs> we're clear on the, on the dimensions. We've got four KSI concrete and 60 KSI steel. We have four number 10s for the tensile steel, but for the compressive steel, we have two number 7s. So the area is 1.2 square inches. Um, D 
is 24 inches, D prime is two and a half inches, and B is 14, um, and with that, I think we should be uh, fairly uh, set. Now, we did do some of this problem last time, and I know we were in a little bit of a hurry, so I want to try and review what it is that we did. Um, so once this loads up, there we go. So we started off this example just like we did the previous one. We said C equals T. Let's solve for the stress block depth that, that maintains that relationship. But in order to solve for A, we made an assumption. We assumed that the compressive force in that upper layer of steel was AS prime FY. So by making that assumption, we're basically saying, let's, let's guess that the steel yields. So we calculated an A value and then said, okay, now we've got to verify that assumption. We went and calculated epsilon sub S prime, and we found out that assumption was wrong. Okay? So in other words, uh, the A depth is not 4.866 inches because the compression steel does not yield. Okay? So when this assumption is invalid, we have to go uh, back to equilibrium. And in order to do that, we have to use that quadratic relationship. So we go back to equilibrium and it's just a quadratic equation. Okay, so here's how this is going to work. Okay, if you go to that slide in that packet I just gave you, there are terms in each of those brackets. I'm going to compute each one of those terms. So the first one is 0 0.85 FC prime beta 1 B. Does everybody see that? If you go to right here, I'm looking at this quadratic relationship and I'm computing this one. So this is all the junk in front of C squared. Then we'll compute all the junk in front of C and then the constant by itself. Sound good? All right. So let's plug and chug. So we've got 0 0.85. FC prime, what is FC prime for this problem? Four. For, for what? There we go, 4 KSI. Um, let's see, B, or beta sub 1, what is beta sub 1 for 4 KSI concrete? 0.85. And then B is 14 inches, right? Now you're going to be mad at me, but I'm going to do this calculation, and I'm actually going to be a little loose uh, on the units. The reason why I'm being a little loose on the units is because as long as everything's consistent, it really doesn't matter because uh, all the units will, will wash out in the end. Notice how everything's in kips and everything's in inches. So if I plug and chug, what do I get for this value? 40.46. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this and I'm going to put a big box around it. Okay? <coughs> Now the next term, what's the next term that's in the brackets? It's for the linear term, it's AS prime ES times 0 .003 minus ASFY. Does everybody see that? Okay, so AS prime ES 0 .003 um, minus ASFY. So this is, what is AS prime? It is 1.20. What is ES? There we go. 0 0.003 minus 5.06 square inches times 60 KSI. And it is okay if these terms come out, or if, when you do these calculations, it's okay if they come out positive or negative, because we're solving a quadratic equation. We actually kind of need some variation in the signs. It's okay. Does anybody have an answer for this one? Is it? Negative 199.2. Two. That's fine. That is correct. So it's okay that these terms come out negative. All right. 
Everybody all right with this? Okay, now, the last term, so watch what I'm going to do for this last term. What's the last term inside the brackets? AS prime ES All right, sound good? But in order to make sure that I don't mess this up, if you go back to the PowerPoint and go back to the equation, this has a minus in front of it. Everybody see that? So I'm going to go ahead and account for that now. All right. So I'm going to put this minus right here. So this is minus 1.2 square inches, 29,000 KSI. 0 0.003. And what's D prime? Okay. So what does this come out to be? 261. Yeah, uh, do we have a second on that? All right, so negative 261. All right. So the reason why I'm boxing these numbers is now it makes writing out the equation that I'm solving a, a little easier. Because the equation that I'm essentially solving is 40.46c squared minus 199.2c minus 261 equals 0. Like that's the equation that I need to solve. Now, when you solve this equation, you're going to get two answers. So let's write both of those answers down. And let's be pretty specific. Let's go to three decimal places. And, and but you also got two. There's two answers. Okay. All right, it's a quadratic, so there's got to be two answers. The nice thing about this formulation is that right off the bat, one of those answers doesn't make any sense. And what answer doesn't make any sense? The negative, because the neutral axis for the beam can't be above the beam, right? It's got to be somewhere in there. So C equals 5.999, or 5 that's our answer that we're going to use. Now, let's take a look at this, all right? What was the C that we got before? I mean, the C up here. We got a C that was, what, 5.724 inches? That was wrong. It was wrong because it was based on an assumption that the steel yielded and it didn't. Now that we've got a new C, let's see if this value makes sense. And the way that we will determine that, and the way that we will check our assumptions, it's snowing. <laughs> That's how we check our assumptions. No, but the way that we check our assumptions is we verify that the forces in compression equal the forces in tension. So let's see if that works. I don't mind snow. Oh, thank you. Does everybody have this? Does everybody have this? Everybody got this? All right, okay. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Okay, a, cu a couple things. All right, before we um, validate our assumption, I'm going to go ahead and compute our strength reduction factor. Or B. And the way that I'm going to compute that is, well, I would still need that strain in that bottom layer of steel. So C equals 5.999 inches. Then the strain in that bottom layer of steel is 0 0.003 D minus C over C. And what's D? No, no, no. That's D prime. I heard, I heard, what's that? 24. 
24. Yeah, it's not 21 and a half. Is that what somebody said, 21.5? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. So 24 minus 5.999. That's an easy one to, to make sense. I guess you could. You probably could. But I'm being really exact here. What's that? Five point, or what what's it say? Okay, so if it's, z if it's 0 0.009, that's greater than 0 0.005. So we've got V equals 0.9. All right, sound good? All right, if you've got that, then I think everything else will work out pretty well. So let's look at nominal moment capacity. So nominal moment capacity is based, is based on the fundamental principle that C equals T. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compute, well here, let me do this. So the first thing I'm going to do is say A equals beta 1 times C, so that's 0 0.85 times 5.999, that comes out to be, it's like 5.099 inches. I think I'm carrying my decimal points out pretty far because I do want to make a point with the result that we're going to get. Has everybody got that? Uh, like I said, C equals T. So we've got two compressive forces. We have C sub C. We have C sub S prime. Now, here's the thing. C sub C, that is 0 0.85 FC prime AB. 0 0.85 uh, 4 KSI. 5.099 inches times B. What was B? 14. And I think when you do this, uh, what do you get? Like two, what is it? How can you all do this one? We'll say to two decimal places. Two decimal places, um, I think, is enough to um, uh, get the point across. 242.71 kips, right? Okay, and I think, yeah, this is enough just to get the point across. In all honesty, if you said six inches, I'd be totally fine with that, but I wanted to carry it out to make a point. Now, C sub S prime, how do we compute that? Do we take A S prime times F Y? No. We don't do that because that would be assuming that the steep yielded and that's wrong, okay? So I propose that it is the area of the steel times whatever the stress is, okay? Now the stress is Hooke's Law, E times whatever the strain is, right? Make sense? And then the strain is 0 0.003 C minus D prime over C. Does that make sense? Because again, it hasn't yielded. So the stress is going to be lower than, uh, than, than 60 KSI. And we'll see that actually because we're going to, that's how we'll calculate this. So we have the area, what's the area of the compression steel? So, 29,000 KSI. Now before you all calculate this in your, in your calculator, I want you to do something for me. So this is 5.999 minus 2.5. Five point nine nine nine. Now, help me out with this. 
would you all agree that all of that, that is F, that's the stress, right? What is that? So everything except 1.2. Fifty point seven four, but what's the yield stress? This is sixty FY sixty, right? So this is another check to our math. I mean, we made an assumption that the steel yielded, which means it hit sixty ksi. We found out we were wrong. When we go back and do the, the math to uh, for, to assume that it doesn't yield, and then check that math, we get a stress of 50.74 KSI. So that's another check to ensure what we're doing makes sense. Now, what do we get when we multiply everything out? 60.89 kips. Everybody okay with that? Our fundamental principle still must hold C equals T. So let's do a check down here. I'll, I'll do a check. Now what is C sub C plus C S prime? What does that come out to be? Again, we track decimals pretty diligently. Say it again. 303.5? Or is it points? Now, how do we compute the tensile force? The tensile steel, that does yield. I mean, we just checked that and we did that up here, but it better yield because the strain limit's at least 0 .004. That's just going to be ASFY. So that is, what is AS? Times 60 KSI. Let's get my marker ready. marker ready. No. <laughs> In all seriousness though, do, does that make sense? <laughs> does that make sense? I, that, that is, in all honesty, if you're ever in doubt when you're doing one of these problems, do that. Go through and do that check. That has to happen. If you, let, let's put it like this, if you did this on the, the previous slide, and you didn't validate that assumption. You just said, oh, don't worry about it. And you do C equals T, it won't work. Okay? And it won't work because this was invalid. Okay? Does that make sense? If you ignore this check right here, this strain check, and you take this A value and this and this A value and just do C sub C and C sub S prime and use these values, you won't get C equals T because this was wrong. All right? Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? This is, that that's kind of important. Right. Well, if you've got that, does everybody have everything on this panel? Yes, sir. It means you did something wrong. Well, I... His words. <laughs> Off on that. In all seriousness, that's what it means. It means there's something wrong in your math. Look, look, the beam cannot run away from you. Right? Compression has to equal tension. So one of those assumptions has to be true. And if you're still not getting anything right, then you did something wrong. I mean, that, that's really what it means. Improper use of the Casio FX 115ES plus. All right, did that answer your question? Okay. Everybody else? All right. Well, if you understand this, then the moment capacity in the VMN should be pretty straightforward. Um, MN is actually going to be the same formula as uh, before. It's a compressive force times that moment arm. Which, I mean, it's the same thing we derived last time, plus CS prime D minus D prime. 
The only difference is we're using different formulations of CS prime because it hadn't yielded. That's the only difference. It's still the same force at the same point in the beam. That didn't change. So we have 242.71 times 24 minus, there you go. Make sure you use that A, not the A we computed before because that was wrong. Um, uh, well, you tell me. 2.5. Remember, top of the beam to where the compression steel is. D is the top of the beam to where the tensile steel is. So what do we get for this? Now, first off, what, the unit, what are the units going to be? Inch kips. It's a moment. Let's say 4, yeah, or something like that, 0. 0.4. 65.15.4. I got a second on that? So what's that in foot kips? And so if that's MN, what is phi MN? 0.9 times that. And what is 0.9? What do you think? It's not, is that, is that so bad? I mean, it's, it, you're just going through, verifying your assumptions. That's all there is to it. Okay. Um, any questions? Because I do want to talk a little bit about shear and getting into that a little bit. I'm not going to get crazy and do any examples, but I do want to talk about it. Yes, sir. You could, um, but you have, well, you've got two forces there. You've got um, the stress block, and then you've got the compression steel. So you, you'd have to pick either one of those. Do you see what I mean? Are you talking about this or just in general? Yeah, I mean... Well, no, no, no. There's three forces, okay? So if you... Let's look at it like this. So if, if here's your stress profile, before what we had was we had, you know, some stress block, right? And we had a tensile force going like this. So, you know, like, like that, like that, like that, like that. Sound good? Okay. Now we idealized that compressive force as a single force like that. So this was C and this was T, right? So when we sum moments, we said, well, it doesn't really matter C or T. We can pick either one. And our moment arm is whatever that distance is right there. Okay? So if it's just a singly reinforced beam, I don't, it doesn't really matter. Okay? You can pick either one. But um, for this instance, that's not the case because we've got, you know, the same old tensile force, which we're calling TS, it's, it's the same as it was, but instead of having just a single compressive force, we've got two. We've got this, which is C sub C, right? But we're also going to have one more. Wherever that rebar is, maybe it's like right here, we're going to have a CS prime. We've got two forces because there's two components generating compression. The concrete and then that layer of steel. So you're saying it would be easier to sum moments uh, about the compression because there's only one force. But what I'm saying to you is, which compression? You could, look, there's nothing wrong with saying, I want to sum moments, you know, let's say right there. And you could eliminate the compressive force in the concrete, but you still got 
the compressive force in the steel times that whatever that little known arm is right there. I think based on the notation that we've developed and the terms that we've used, it's just kind of easier in this instance to some moments from here. That's just sort of my preface. There is nothing wrong with saying, no, I want to, no, I'm, I want to some moments at the center of the compressive block. Nothing wrong with that at all. Does that make sense? Any other questions? This is good stuff. Everybody good? All right. <coughs> if you're good there, then um, that sh you should be good on homework um, homework five, and I do want to at least slightly introduce um, shear. Okay. Now um, the way we handle shear is a lot like the way we handle moment uh, in terms of capacity. But for instance, for um, moment, uh, we've essentially relied on the fact that compression has to equal tension, and then our moment capacity is generated by force times distance. We're using very, very similar provisions for shear, but the actual uh, methods that we use to design the reinforcement and all that are, are, are wildly different. So going back to basics, let's make sure everybody's clear on this. You know, when we have a, something simple like a beam with a uniformly distributed load, we have a moment diagram. However, we've also got a shear diagram. Okay? Now, I'd argue that in, uh, for shear, you need a, a little bit of a better understanding, not just of the shear diagrams, but also if you want to use those equations, this little uh, that guide I gave you at the beginning of the semester, remember the packet of all the different shear diagrams and moment diagrams for all those loading cases. I'd argue that you know, they're just, it's just fine to use those. Uh, however, the, the, you need a really good understanding of them because unlike with moments, see with moments we just found like maximum moment and designed accordingly. WL squared over 8 and then that was it, right? However, for shear, we're going to be designing shear along the beam, designing reinforcement along the beam. I mean, we're actually going to need to plot the shear across the beam and design different regions of uh, reinforcement. You, this is kind of an image of, of what we will get. Um, like, for instance, near the support, we have a really tight grouping of stirrup spacings, but out in the middle, they're, pretty, they're spaced pretty farly apart. That spacing is pretty proportional to this. Low shear in the middle, so a low amount of stirrups in the middle, but high shear near the support, uh, so a lot of stirrups there. Yes, sir. It is. It, it is. Is that we call that a rebar cage? Essentially, they'll tie the rebar and then just sort of lower it into the forms and then fill it with concrete. But yeah, it's all tied together. But, yeah. um, this is sort of what I was saying earlier with the compression steel. I mean, from a design standpoint, at the very least for a beam like this, you would need tensile steel to resist the moment, and you would need these stirrups to resist the shear. And a lot of times, just to make the darn thing easy to tie together and lower into the forms, we throw a couple bars up top just to tie everything together. It's it, not even really for strength purposes, just to make it a little easier to handle. Okay, So that's what I was saying earlier, that um, well, not, we don't necessarily need to design for compression steel. We could account for it because it's there. You see what I mean? Does that make sense to everybody else? Okay. Um, so what happens to concrete when it's loaded in shear? I will bring back a, an oldie. Y'all remember this? Remember Moore's circle? Ooh. An oldie, but it's a goodie. It's an oldie, but it's a goodie. Well, you're, I, I heard so. Oh, that's a square. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if you remember, if you remember though, from Moore's circle. I mean, let, let's go back to deformable. I mean, what was the purpose of Moore's circle? The purpose is to try and determine what the states of stress are at a given point if you change your orientation. In other words, if you have a given state of stress and you're looking at it like this, but then you change your orientation and you look like this, how do the stresses change? Okay. Now, a very classic uh, instance in a, uh, a scenario like this is what happens if you have a stress element that's only undergoing shear. And you find that when you go through and do your more circle analysis, that the worst case orientation is when the, your orientation is at 45 degrees because you've got 
pure tension in one direction and pure compression in another. Now, what does concrete not like? It doesn't like tension, right? It behaves very well in compression, but very poorly in tension. So in this direction, concrete's going to be very weak. If you look at a beam that's loaded in shear, look at how it fails. Look at how the concrete is opening. It's opening along its weakest direction, the direction that it's experiencing tension. Does everybody see that? When you look at a concrete beam and you look near the supports and you see shear cracks, they're going to be just 45 degree angle. Does that make sense? And I wanted everybody to kind of understand that. One of the other things about shear failures is when they go, they go quick. And I'll kind of, hold on, let's, let's open up Chrome and then I'll type something and it'll say, you know that Microsoft Edge is much faster, right? Here we go. Meaning no shillings. Right, so, click that one. Can okay, everybody hear that? <laughs> All right, let's go to about right here. See? So before I let them go. So you can see that the beam is being loaded. Um, now they have the beam loaded in what, what's called four-point bending. Okay. Now the reason why they have the beam loaded in four-point bending is because if you recall, I wonder if I can draw right here. Oh, I can't. If you recall from structures, a beam that is loaded like this, it has a load like that and a load like that, if you look at its shear diagram, its shear diagram does this. It goes up, down, over, down, and up. So my point is, is that these two outer regions of the beam are essentially experiencing, for the most part, pure shear, and there's no shear at all in the middle. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. So, so like I said, when 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 shear, be quiet. When when elements fail in shear, they fail quite quickly and quite suddenly because you're placing a fair amount of shear in a very um, quick uh, time frame. Now, if you notice, notice how most of the crack occurred along this path, kind of right here. Like that's where the initial failure was. And and I know it sort of popped off. Let me see if I can. Now you can see, you can even see it right here. Like, see how this is where the crack was onset? Like, that's where it started. And it started at that 45 degree angle. Now, it wasn't exactly 45 degrees because concrete is a granular material. There's, you know, gravel and rocks and all that in, di in different orientations. But, but in the end, that's sort of how it wanted to fail. And it was very, very slow. Okay? So, if you ever are in a building and you're doing some sort of inspection and you see a shear crack on a beam, uh, you move. You get out of there because the, the shear failures happen quite quickly. So it didn't have any compression steel, no, but it did have stirrups. It did have stirrups. All right. So is everybody okay with that? So let me be clear on the design from, from a design standpoint. When you design. Um, for shear, it's actually pretty straightforward. The first thing you need to talk about, obviously, is the capacity. Well, this is the way we look at it. You've got a force being applied. So, you know, samurai sword or lightsaber throughout the section, right? So, I mean, it, it's pretty simple. So, you know, you've got a beam. You've got some support and some load on it, right? And you samurai sword or cake cutter right through the section, right? 
Okay? So you've got ultimately all these downward forces going down on the structure, right? Well, there's really only two forces that can resist opposite of that, you know, internally inside the section. A shear force that's developed in the concrete and a shear force that's developed in the steel. That, that's it. So the nominal capacity of an uh, element in shear is the shear strength provided by the concrete plus the shear, shear strength provided by the steel. That's it. That, that's essentially what you got. So does that make sense? Now one of the nice things about um, uh, shear design is if for bending we had a little bit of work that we had to do to even figure out what phi was. For shear, 0.75. It's simple. Okay. So it, it, that, that makes our lives a, a little bit easier. Sound good? Okay. Now let's start off with each one of those. So the shear capacity provided by the concrete. Two times lambda. Remember lambda was that lightweight aggregate factor that we used uh, before for F sub R. And then it's one for normal weight concrete. And it's 0.85 for standard uh, lightweight concrete. And lightweight it's 0.75. I don't remember that. V sub W, that's just the beam width. If it's a T beam, it's the web or width of the web. And if it's a rectangular beam, just over wide the beam is. We have V from the top of the beam to the tensile steel. And then FC prime. Remember, that's the square root of FC prime. You put in PSI, you get out PSI. So just straight plugging and chugging with this uh, formula will give you an answer in pounds. Because you'll take a square root of PSI and get PSI. And then take that and multiply it times inches and times inches. So you'll get pounds. So you'll need to um, uh, convert that to, uh, to kips if you want, or just make sure everything's consistent. Sound good? OK, so that's the uh, capacity of an element uh, in co that is concrete. Here's the capacity of an element uh, that is steel. It is the area of the steel times Fy times uh, what I'm calling N. OK, N is the number of bars per beam depth, OK? And I'll explain why we're doing this. Um, and it's essentially uh, D divided by S, where S is the, uh, the stirrup spacing. He here's why we're doing this. Um, so here's a, a, a reinforced concrete beam that's undergone a shear failure, OK? So this N value, it, what we're doing is this. We're essentially assuming a 45 degree crack and we're saying that the capacity that is generated uh, by the steel is the area times Fy times however many stirrups occur within a single crack. So D divided by S. So it's sort of, you know, in this case, D divided by S, they're trying to illustrate that that would be four stirrups that's in a given crack. You see what I mean? I mean think about it. A closer arrangement of uh, stirrups is going to be a stronger uh, element in shear. Like, I'm getting more V sub S out near the supports than I am in the middle, right? There's more steel. Sound good? So it's A times Fy times um, D over S. Sound good? So the D over S is just assuming that there's a 45 degree crack and it's basically the number of stirrups per crack. Um, now the AV, okay? The AV, think if I Samurai sword, lightsaber, or cake cutter through the, um, through the given section. Let's take a single stirrup. How many bars am I cutting through in this single stirrup? Well, if it's a U-shape or a hoop-shaped stirrup like this, I'm cutting through two, right? So, for instance, uh, if I'm looking at this case, a very common stirrup size is a number three. Now, the area of the single number three bar is 0.11 square inches, but for the area in shear, I would take two times the area. That is, if this is my case. You see what I mean? It's very possible I have other cases. I could have this would be two AV or two area of a bar, two area of a bar. That would just be one area of a bar. This would be four, right? This would be probably something like a large uh, column section uh, or something like that. Sound good? All right. Um, I'm going to get a little bit more into the details. Uh, on Monday when you all get back. Does everybody kind of get the general idea behind shear? Okay, we will talk about that. We'll get into some examples regarding analysis and design uh, next time. And uh, that's all I've got. Your homework's due on Monday. Again, 
I greatly appreciate the cake. One final thing, handouts. If you have not gotten them, do so. I've still got like five copies of handouts. So, I mean, I'm telling you, there's, there's people in here that haven't grabbed them. So, so grab them. All right, thank you again. We'll see y'all. Y'all have a great weekend.